You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors, you're not paying monthly hosting fees, the sound quality is great, the distribution is phenomenal. Friends, download the free Anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started. Remember, you heard it here first on Mysterious Goings On. Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm Alex Greenwood. Hey, we're going to continue our series of talking with authors this season. We're going to talk a little bit about the origin story of our authors. We're going to talk about authors who have been indie sensations or have been mid-listers or have gone all the way up to the bestseller list. We're going to kind of cut across the whole waterfront and talk to authors of varying stripes. And I'm really excited to do that because I think you can get even if you're not an author or a writer yourself, you can get insights in the creative process, which I think is really important. And if you're not heavily into reading mysteries, well, why are you listening to this show? Just kidding. But if you're not heavily into reading mysteries or thrillers or adventures or genre fiction, it's still probably a good thing for you to hear so you can focus on the creative aspects uh, that writers employ that you can use in your own career. So that's why we're excited to have another great writer with us this episode. We'll introduce her in just a moment. But I have one little housekeeping thing to do for you first. Reminder, we have um, the facebook.com slash John Pilot Mysteries Facebook page. It is the de facto MGO podcast uh, Facebook page. And I wanted to draw your attention to something I posted on there. And let me just tell you what it is real quick. Because, uh, you know, Halloween is my all-time favorite holiday. I'm just a kid at heart, I guess, and it's kind of like my Christmas or something. And I am excited that uh, we're going to have a really big Halloween episode coming out around the 27th or 28th, right around there. Well, I want you to be a part of it. You're saying, whoa, how am I going to be a part of this? Well, it's simple. We're looking for your best ghost story or weird moment that we can put on the episode. Yeah, it can be real or imagined. We'll never tell. All you have to do is record your story. Five minutes maximum, please. I, I've got some that are a little longer, so we just need to focus on five minutes or less if we can. Uh, so just record it on your phone or your computer. On, on my iPhone, I can just use the memo app and then I can uh, you know, mail the file to myself or you can mail it to us as an MP3. So all you gotta do is send the MP3 file to us at team at alexgpr.com. Now, the way you do it, be sure to introduce yourself at the beginning of your recording, like your first name and last, if you wish, along with your city, and we'll take it from there. So it's like, hey, this is Alex from Kansas City. You're not going to believe what happened to me once, but, and then you tell your story. You go through your quick anecdote. Try not to uh, add any music. Please don't have any music behind the, st the uh, story because I can add that in. There's an issue if you put uh, even sound effects that are copyrighted and belong to someone else, I can get burned for that. So please don't add any sound effects. Please don't record your uh, message while you're listening to music or the TV or something. I, stranger things could happen, right? Speaking of stranger things. So um, send me that MP3 by October 20th. That is the deadline for the Halloween show. And um, again, send it to team, T-E-A-M, at alexgpr.com. All this will be in our show notes and at mgopod.com. But send it to us by October 20th, and 
you'll be part of the Halloween show. Uh, the legal ease is by submitting your story, you acknowledge that Mysterious Goings On is granted the right to use your recording and your voice. So please do not add, as I said, no co any copyrighted music or sound effects to your file. And please don't come crying to me later and going, I, I wanted to sell you that story. And also, just so you know, I'm not necessarily going to take your story and, and, and put it in one of my books. And, and, but you know what? That's not a bad idea if it's a good story. So anyway, just kidding. So let's hear it. Maybe you can spook our audience as much as your story spooked you. One last time, send your five-minute or less MP3 file. You can record it on your phone or your computer whatever it takes, send it to team at alexgpr.com by October 20th. It should be weird or creepy or it can be funny too. You know, it could be a time when you thought you saw a ghost and you didn't, or it could be the weirdest thing that happened when you were a kid, uh, when you were a kid, when you were trick-or-treating, something like that. Anyway, it's all in good fun. We've already got some great stuff lined up. It's going to be a very big episode. It'll be a longer episode than usual as well. I just, I can't get enough Halloween. And frankly, we all need the distraction between COVID and election madness. All right, we'll be back in just a moment with our interview for this week. Author Lynette M. Burroughs is a survivor. She survived moving to 17 different schools before she graduated from high school. She contends that this makes her uniquely qualified to write a dystopian novel or two. Lynette enjoys coffee, the pleasure of real books, and the crack of a nine millimeter. Not necessarily all at the same time, although they all appear in her stories. Spiced with a dash of intrigue, a dollop of mayhem, and a liberal dose of automatic weapons, her stories aim to entertain. Lynette Burroughs, thanks for taking a shot at Mysterious Goings On. You're welcome, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Well, you know, I have followed you with interest. Uh, we have mutual friends uh, on Twitter, mm -hmm. and you and I are brave enough to 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 get out there in the toxic uh, world of Twitter but uh, and find some good in it. And that's one of the things I find good is that I meet great people. And I started looking at your blog posts because they're always so uh, enticing. You know, I'll see that and I go, <laughs> oh, that, oh, okay, what is she doing there? Oh, I like that. Oh, you know, and... <laughs> What it really got to me, though, and one reason listeners should, should know, is who are frequent listeners to the show, know that we're not just about writing, and we're, not, uh, we're, we're also about reading, and we're also about creativity. And those are like subjects that you really nail in your blog. So in a few, few moments, I want to talk about the blog. But I think first, we should establish uh, what kind of writing you do. And so maybe it'd be good if I just threw it to you and said, Lynette, how did you get started? What do you do? Tell us your origin story. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, <laughs> as with most writers, I started reading fairly early and devoured lots and lots of books. Um, they kind of saved me. As you said in my intro, I moved a lot as a kid. And being the new kid in school all the time and being an introvert, I retreated into books. <laughs> Um, I also did, uh, I kept a journal or a diary when I was a kid for years and years and years. Um, then in 1979, um, I was pregnant with my one and only son. <laughs> Things evolved such that I had to stay home from my nursing job and I thought, this is something I've always wanted to try. I'm going to try writing. So I started um, taking the class. The, they, this is old enough. This was a mail-in program. The internet was not that handy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I do remember these kinds yeah. of things, though. So I took a um, children's... Correspondence. <laughs> The, liter the Institute of Children's Literature, that's what it was called. Oh, right. I took their correspondence class. Um, and um, was encouraged by the instructor, but still was a little hesitant. I uh, went to a conference in Bloomington, Illinois, where I met my idol, Madeline Langle. Oh, my God. And she read one of my stories. No way. Yes. <laughs> and she told me I should be writing novels. 
and I was just, <laughs> I was so speechless. <laughs> I think she probably thought I was <laughs> not terribly bright. <laughs> because... No, Lynette, no, I would have fainted dead away. You would have had to call the, you know, the ambulance for me. If, if, if... Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> it was pretty much that kind of response. <laughs> I was just, I was stunned. And as you can see, I'm still emotionally um, responsive to that. <laughs> sure. Um, and that kind of launched me on, a, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, I had my first published story was a 700 word children's story. And I chose children's fiction at the time because I was a pediatric nurse. Okay. okay. And I had lots of exposure to children. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was shortly after that, um, that my now ex-husband <laughs> introduced me to science fiction conventions. He was oh. a big reader as well. And we had a house full of science fiction books, many of which I had already read. Um, but at the convention, I met real life authors <laughs> who were like me at my level, or some of them were way above me, but, um, and that was when I started writing science fiction. My goodness. You know, I, if, if someone as legendary as she had said that to me, I, I think I would just never, ever lose my spark. I think I, even in my worst days, I would just have that, maybe that quote pasted over my <laughs> typewriter or my computer, you know? Oh my goodness. I had no idea about that, by the way. That is fantastic. So when you say you write science fiction though, to, to bring this in a little closer, because so, so you, is it children's science fiction you did write those kinds of stories more or more I, fantasy or how'd that go? I have written um, a children's story and a um, YA novel in the science fiction realm. It was a colony type of new colony type of story. Mm. Um, those will probably never see the light of day. <laughs> they were the kinds of things where you make all of the mistakes of a beginner. <laughs> yeah. I've got a few of those. Um, and then a local science fiction author, Rob Chilson, um, and a few others in the area invited me to join them for um, kind of a coffee clutch type of thing where we would just sit around in a, at uh, a restaurant and, and talk business or just chat in general, just to get out of the house. Sure. Um, and Rob Chilson ended up at the end of one of those meetings asking me to co-author a story with him because it had some medical, a lot of medical excess. Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> you know, that's interesting, too, because that, that says so much more about you as well, in my opinion, that, that another author asked you to, to co-write, because I have maybe once in my career as a writer asked, and I did it kind of sheepishly, and I was gently rebuffed because so many writers just, I think, find it difficult to write with other people or, or they view writing as such a solitary craft. So uh, it's, even though he was definitely wanted to also access your medical knowledge, I think it says a lot about you as a person and as a writer that he did that. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, we are still fast friends even though we co-wrote, <laughs> we actually ended up writing um, three novellas together, two of which got published in Analog Science Fiction, Science Fact Magazine. Jeez Louise, that is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about the stuff I read when I was a kid a lot. Um, I, uh, you know, the, remember the, the greatest science fiction stories of, you know, yes. those books? Yes, I consumed those as a young person. Um, I was a very early reader anyway. I was reading that stuff at age 10, 11, 12, and just mm -hmm. going, um, and there's so many of those stories where I can still remember the hooks in those stories, you know? Yeah. Um, 
but uh, uh, so I I just love that you've been you've been swimming in those waters as well. Um, so you've got a couple of your debut novel though, right? That was in your own right was pardon the pun was my soul to keep, which is Correct. it's it's a now is that is that dystopian? Yes. I'm, okay. Alternate history dystopian. <laughs> was that fun to write the alternate history stuff? Yes, it was because that was stuff from my childhood and and earlier (laughs) so yeah yeah i've been fascinated by that con the idea i've always wanted a lot of people want to write you know what if jfk had lived actually i had a story in mind what if rfk had lived and i i I started mapping out something like that that i thought would be interesting because you know vietnam would have been different all these different things but also uh i've read some good fiction i think uh, where what if world war ii went the other way uh Although the the TV version of the Man in the High Castle diverges, I kind of I enjoyed that as well. I don't know if you mm-hmm. caught any of that, but uh, that stuff's so much so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, no, I've unfortunately not been able to catch that, but um, that's kind of the vein I went in with my Soul to Keep. I I chose to focus on the isolationist period in ah. the United States history and. Lindbergh. What, hap- what would have happened if folks like Lindbergh s- continued to support that idea, kept us out of the world war, um, and America became more isolationist and more fundamental? And how would that affect society? Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm just adding you to the stack. Just a moment. My soul to keep. <laughs> Very good. How was it received? I uh, five star debut novel. It looked like it had some good reviews. It How'd has, you feel about that? Oh, oh what author doesn't love a five star review? <laughs> 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 um, it's it's been very well received by the folks who have read it. It's unfortunately not seen a whole lot of people yet. Yeah, um, but it is one book in the series, and I understand a lot of people want to buy the full series, so. Yeah, I think I've shot myself in the foot with that. Uh, I start, I started a, a book as a lark, and then I thought, oh, I'll make it a trilogy, and now I'm on book eight. And I, th- <laughs> I think I think you just hit on it. Well, maybe the reason it's really not selling anymore is because they're waiting on you to get to the final last positively that's it book. So I'm going to stop right now. I think that's <laughs> I, I think you just saved me a lot of work, Lynette. So I owe oh. you. Well, okay. Well, I'm not sure your readers will agree. But. <laughs> I might just be down to reader, the singular, but we don't know. Um, so, so you say it's so you say my soul to keep is part of a, a series, then? Okay. Yes. Can, there will so, be how three can you? Books. Oh, there will be three. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, are you currently working on the next the next one? Or I am in the editing phase of book two, um, which is called "If I Should Die." Ooh. Oh, I, can, um, I think I see a pattern here. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> In this one, the protagonist from um, My Soul to Keep, it's about two years later, and America is in its second world war, civil oh, war. Civil war. Oh, civil war. wow. Oh, man, this so, is fascinating. Um, <laughs> when can um, we expect it, do you think? You say you're, you're getting close, so... Uh, Will it be out this year I or had you think of next? hoped it would have been out this year, but that's not going to happen now. Yeah. Um, we had some personal issues at the beginning of the year and then COVID hit and Ugh, yeah. <laughs> my writing schedule went crazy for a while. Um, I'm back on track, thank goodness. And yeah. so I'm thinking spring of next year, probably uh, if, everything holds together the way it's supposed to. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of thought as uh, early on with COVID, I thought, well, Hey, you know, I was, I was losing I'm, you know, my day job. Things were slowing way down. I thought, Oh, I'll have all this extra time. I don't know about you, but yeah, like you said, your writing schedule went all to heck and, and mine too. And my focus just went completely yes. my, and my discipline and my focus just went out the window. And it sounds like I'm making excuses, but I, it's the truth. No, for about two months, Mine did too. It was just, I couldn't focus on 
anything. It was, it was very ADHD in that I'd be looking at the news and then I'd be trying to write and then I'd be trying to deal with some family stuff and then I'd be, you know, and it was just <laughs> not a creative time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not glad to hear that for your sake, but it, it does help me. And I bet it, it helps a lot of our listeners who are in the same boat to understand that and don't kick yourself because for a while there, I was thinking, and you had months, buddy, when you could have finished this, this latest book. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't want to, I would start it up and I would just get sick of the sight of it. And I would just, it, anyway, it's, it's, it's sad and de- sad to hear that, but it's, it's gladdening. Gosh, that was a terrible sentence. Um, to hear that you're back on the <laughs> back in the saddle, though. Um, so, and, and I, I apologize for jumping around a little bit here, but um, uh, you've got an action adventure story I see called Fellowship about a young man yes. and his three siblings who go to the Blue Ridge Mountains. What's going on there? That is in the world of the Fellowship, which is um, the Fellowship dystopia, which is per- the world that my soul to keep is in. Um, and it has a couple, uh, yeah, it has, it's got about three characters in it from my soul to keep. They're, they're side characters. Um, and this is kind of their origin story in how they get involved in being rebels. Ooh. So you're really, you're built, you are into world building then. Mm-hmm. This is, you've made this, this whole thing here. Um, so if you don't mind, let me just step back a, a little bit on this. What is it, what about dystopia? We talked, we touched on it earlier a little bit, but is there something about dystopian fiction that appeals to you for a certain reason or is it, is there, do you have any idea? Um, I've been influenced by a lot of dystopian fiction that I've read. Um, of course, The Handmaid's Tale being the biggest title of that um but as i said in my bio i actually do feel i had a bit of a dystopian upbringing (laughs) um it wasn't you know nothing like anything i write about but but um i have a connection i guess is the word with people who don't fit in Uh. and that's kind of one of the big themes of dystopian fiction you're you're seeing the world from the person who doesn't fit in that society and frequently that person who doesn't fit in is actually um the the maybe better is not the right word but the, the more virtuous or you know, at the very least, I think more virtuous usually, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the hero in these dystopian stories is the one who actually is like, I don't fit in because I'm not going to buy into these things that are, that are horrible. You know, right. uh, I'm not going to survive. I'm not going to survive. I'm going to try to live that kind of thing. So I love that. I love that perspective. Okay. Well, let me take a step back from the books for a moment to just ask a, cause I, I did mention, um, uh, that you're also a prolific blogger. And one of the reasons, as I said earlier, that I wanted to interview you is because your blog really touches on reading, writing, and creativity so very much. Do you find blogging is still a vital way to connect with with readers beyond your books? Um, The short answer is yes. The long answer is that it probably doesn't connect me with new readers very much. Hmm. Um, I think new readers are come there eventually. Um, and perhaps I've gotten a couple of new readers because they visited the blog, but I don't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, what it does do for me is <laughs> it helps me be disciplined. <laughs> mm, yeah. It helps, um, it does help me connect with current readers or, or fans, if you want to call them that. Um, I get a lot of positive feedback from them. Um, I get into some discussions about some of the ethical issues that we'll discuss from time to time. Um, As you mentioned, my reading and my writing 
posts are fairly popular and I get a fair amount of response to that is that building my readership probably not not much anyway at this point um, but it is definitely building my brand and building my connection with those readers that regularly read the blog. Right. I, I, once I started this enterprise in 2016, I, I stopped effectively blogging for my readers and just do this, which um, some people say, oh, that's easier. I'm like, well, I, <laughs> it's not necessarily <laughs> easier to, you know, because my first few months of this, it was basically me reading my work and me talking. And then I realized nobody, nobody wants to hear you talk about you that much. I don't want to hear <laughs> me talk about me at all. So I started interviewing great people like you and it's really taken off. But you know what I got to say, Lynette? I don't think it's helped me sell hardly any books. I don't, I don't right. have anybody who listens who says, I just bought all your books because I love your podcast. That's never happened. Right. So, but, right. but I, but I, I want to do it because it's important to me. Uh, the, greatest, the greatest gift I've received from this has not been obviously sales, but it is from talking to people like you about the craft and learning things and, and making friends and being told, this is what I, I, I always, I think I find myself listening for quite often from other writers is, uh, you know, Alex, you're not alone. We've been through that too. <laughs> and it's okay. Yes. You know? <laughs> so, yes. and, so, so that's what I what, like on Twitter when I see our friend Terry and she's like, Oh, there's another great post from Lynette. And I'm like, I got to go check this out because I'm, I know I'm going to get something out of it. And I do. And I, I mean, I was looking at your blog just r right before we start. And I just thought, well, let me make sure I'm, I'm up on what's going on here. The latest post, five ways to support your creativity. I'm like, yes, she's going to be my <laughs> guest this week on the <laughs> podcast about writing and creativity. And it's such, it's so great, folks. If you haven't been to LynetteMBurrows.com, she's got this great blog. And what I love here is you, in this blog post, obviously I'm not going to read it to people, but you talk about, you know, how you need supportive people, supportive peeps, peers, mentors, mentees. Talk about refilling the well, your spirituality, creatively, physically, all these different things. And this is all useful, very useful stuff. And so much of it, Lynette, that I've read in some of the previous blog posts, um, I'm always just so pleased by the depth of these things that, you know, as you said, it, it keeps helps you keep your writing discipline, I'm sure, because these are not just tossed off things as far as I'm concerned. And please understand what I mean by that. I just mean that, you know, sometimes people will just get on there and kind of offer a few nuggets and disappear. But you've got these very well-written essays um, that, you know, frankly, I think could be read like into a podcast, you know, as like a tip, you know, or something, not a tip, but as an essay, an audio essay, and they would sound great. Uh, and people get so much out of it. So I guess the question I would have is, do, do you do you know what you're going to write about every morning or every afternoon when you do these? Or do you just sit down and say, you know, creativity seems like a good one? Or do you map that out? <laughs> um, I am consistently inconsistent. <laughs> 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 I will have a map for a while. I'll decide, okay, this month, for example, is September and it's labor lots of labor, we have Labor Day, we have lots of labor type celebrations. So I'll focus on labor issues and people. And then something happens where usually it's something that impacts me. Mm -hmm. The five ways to support your creativity. I was feeling kind of, oh, disconnected and um, <laughs> not lacking creativity but just not feeling the energy right um so i thought well i started looking up things to help me and thought yeah. this would make a great post yeah <laughs> so it ended up a post the uh post you did and i love this one the one on the the i want to make the, the, the mystical adventure of reading for pleasure Yes. <laughs> um, and this, the, all these wonderful quotes about reading and all this stuff. But I have to ask a quick question on here. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm, sorry, folks who haven't read this, go to her blog. It's the link in the show notes. You'll find it. Yeah. Um, on having <laughs> lots of books. Is that your book nook or is that just one you from somewhere you found? Oh, that was from, um, from Pixabay. Okay. Yeah. It's great. One of yeah. my sources for photos. No, um, I have a lot of books 
but I am not, I'm a writer. I'm not a housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, well, the, the blog is great for readers and writers. And again, um, as I say to listeners on this show a lot, whether you're a reader or a writer, or neither or both, um, creativity, learning about creativity um, is beneficial no matter what walk of life you're in. Lynette, I don't know. We, we've had guests who design food products uh, mm-hmm. for, for, for restaurants. We've had, we've, and we hear about the, how the creative process works with them. So I, I think it's really important if you listen to this show for uh, insights into creativity, you can't go wrong listen, uh, reading Lynette's blog. Um, and I'm not putting a lot of pressure on you, Lynette. And you're like, great. Now they're going to come expecting brilliance every week. But I think it'll happen. So it's lynettemburrows.com and just check on our blog. Now, what I also like here, though, you are really, um, you're really into, and as you discussed previously, you're really into the writing community, aren't you? Uh, yes. <laughs> you, you, you don't strike me as like lone wolf, like I'm just, you know, you want to connect with other writers, and in so doing, on your blog, you have writing resources, just from everything from organizations, books you recommend, um, to, on technique, and I mean, deep stuff here. We're talking character development, tips and inspiration, podcast, polishing your prose website. This is fantastic. So did this also kind of just stem out of, well, this is the stuff I use and I want to share it with you. Um, just, is this just years of stuff that you've been relying upon and you wanted to make sure you offered it to other writers? Uh, I guess the real question beyond that, that's probably the obvious answer is probably yes. But I guess the real question is just, where did that come from? Was it because your career started and another writer basically reached out to you and helped, helped you? And, and of course, an incredibly famous writer read some of your stuff and told you you're brilliant, you should write novels? Yes, that is part of it in that I felt, I have always felt very supported by the writing community that I am part of. Um, and the folks that I happen into um, I have had partially because of the science fiction convention, um, local uh, club, um, but I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of of famous authors and um, have found for the most part, they are very uh, warm and um, welcoming people. Um, And I felt the need to pay that back yeah. You know, to pay it forward. That's also part of who I am as a nurse. I have always tried to take care of other people. Right. That's just part of who I am. And when I started this website, I thought right away, that was one of the things I wanted to do was to have this list of resources. They are all things that I have tried or I know someone personally who has tried. Yeah. Um, and I, it was the way I taught myself how to write. I read, I can't even tell you how many how to write books. Oh yeah. And it's one of the things I recommend to new writers. Don't go with one class. Don't go with one book. Yeah. Read as much as you can about it. <laughs> watch podcasts do all of the learning until you are so sick of learning Uh, that you've got to write (laughs) right um but then you can choose which pieces of advice fit you and the stories you write the best yes absolutely i think that's great advice i think uh people get really hung up and i think there's uh uh, there's a paralysis that can set in um, on new writers because they're so overwhelmed with, you know, doing it. I mean, that's why I go back to the story about Madeline Lingle is the fact that you, that's an incredibly brave thing to ask her to read your stuff. You know, <laughs> that's, I mean, come on, your first out of the gate, your first few, you know, year of writing or, yes. and, and <laughs> that's huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's ostentatiously crazy. And I mean that in the nicest, best way. It's just like, this is outrageously smart and courageous of you. And it paid off for you because you got this wonderful feedback. But I think a lot of writers that are starting out, 
they're, they're so overwhelmed, they just maybe don't get the encouragement they need, or they think they're not very good. And, and, and as you know, you alluded to, and, and I'll, I'll certainly verify for myself is, you know, when I started, I wasn't very good. Um, right. You know, I'm never going to be great, but I'm, I am much better now having written, seriously written for 15 years, um, my whole life, but like really tried to write, you know, mm -hmm. as a professional for the last 15 years. So I, I think that's fantastic. You offer these things. Now, I want to flip this over real quick as we're, gosh, this conversation is already going, going great. And we're, we're going to have to shut it down soon because we want to make sure people keep listening. Um, you do this, this thing, you have something called Burroughs Insiders. Yes. Um, I, I have never quite seen this presented this way. Can you just for just for a quick second, explain to listeners what, what that's all about and what that means to a writer? That is a group of readers who've signed up for being members of that group. Um, and they receive advanced reader copies of anything that I am ready to publish. They get it before I publish the book. I ask that they give me feedback on what their reactions are. Um, if they find any mistakes or whatever, yeah. that please tell me. Um, and I ask that they review the book on whatever website, book readers or personal website or store website that they choose, um, just to, to help spread the word. I also ask some of them to spread the word yeah. through Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media they're on. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. It's kind of, uh, some people call it a street team. Right. Digital street team these days. Right. Yeah. Some people call it a um, arc readers. Or beta readers. Or some. beta readers. Yeah. 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 But I'd like, to, but I, I like, Lynette, I like the way you framed it though. You've made it into this kind of insider. Everybody wants to be an insider. You see, that's such a great marketing. You know what I mean? You're, you're part of the secret group. You get, you get early access. I mean, it's so many writers are not good at that, at, at marketing themselves that way and getting, gosh, getting reviews. It's just crazy hard. And yes, it is. <laughs> so, so if you, so if, the, if you, if these folks deliver on the reviews, particularly on Goodreads and library thing and gosh, Amazon, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, mm -hmm. Huge. Well, I, I just had to share that. I think it's a brilliant idea. By the way, you're going to get ripped off by a lot of writers listening to this. So I hope you <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's part of you giving back, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> Lynette, I have to ask you one more thing and then I'm going to toss it to you to talk about anything I didn't ask you about as we wrap it up here. I am, I, I don't know what the, where this is, but there's pictures of you on the vlog, on the about section here, um, where you talk about your, your personal life and all these things. There's a couple of shots of you with weaponry, and I'm not talking about, you know, a Derringer here. You've got like a sniper rifle, and what the heck is that like a, I don't know what that is. It's, a, it's anyway, what is going on with that? Well, um, one of the books that I am researching is about, um, initially was starting to be about a sniper, um, a female sniper. Um, that's evolving. I'm not sure that's going to end up being a sniper, but she will take a couple of shots. Yeah. And um, my current husband is um, a weapons expert, I guess mm. is what I should call him, um, particularly of the Vietnam era. Gotcha. Um, but he's, he, for a time, he had um a website where he he's a creative person himself and he created drawings of weapons by history by groupings of uh pre-world war one world war one pre-world war two world war two those kinds of groupings um but as a result he would do a lot of trade shows. Um, he has giftware and all that kind of stuff related to it. Mm. Um, and during those shows, he met several people that became great resources for me. <laughs> <laughs> and what you see there is 
one of those folks um, who became a friend, he was local at the time, um, was a Vietnam sniper. Oh, wow. And he was showing me how to do it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, it was an amazing experience. Um, and um, will probably show up in a lot of different books over my career. <laughs> it's, it's so important. See, that's the thing too. Uh, just so you know, um, um, I, not, not a huge gun person or anything, but I realize I write, I write thrillers and there's gun use. Right. And I felt like, I, I don't really know much about guns. You know, I know how they work and all that stuff. So I learned. I, I, right. I'm, I'm a very good shot with a nine millimeter, you know, uh, my Smith and Wesson, you know, I, but I did it primarily because I wanted to understand. Um, you, you get a real understanding for the immense power that yes. you have when you're behind a weapon. And, and I'm going to tell you, I fired, uh, uh, I've got a family member who's very much more into weaponry than I am. And I fired a, a, a sub, you know, machine gun that he has. Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, that made me, Call me what you will. That made me very uncomfortable. That was just firing so much in such a short period of time. And I, the, the, it just, the feeling it gave me was not good. Um, when I fired a handgun, my Smith & Wesson, my 9 mil, you know, target practicing and all that stuff, that's, that's still a very awesome feeling of you've got power here and it's to be respected and you've got to be safe and careful. So I just, I, I did that because my character fires weapons and I just wanted to make sure I wasn't one of those writers who was clearly faking that. Right. Um, I, so it sounds like you, you're in the same boat. Correct. Very much so. In fact, if I made mistakes with weaponry, I think my husband would have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I've got, an, yeah, I've got a nephew who's a police officer. I should check in with him on some stuff, actually. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, it's something he comments on all the time, much like when I read a story that has some medical stuff or first mm. aid stuff, and they get it wrong, I'm, ah, and I throw the book, you know, oh, yeah. it's like, I can't even finish reading this because they are so far off base. I, I mean, one of my books, we had to put a character into a medically induced coma. Mm -hmm. And my brother-in-law is a nurse practitioner. And I just, I texted him. I said, what would you give somebody who had this, this, and this happen if you want to induce a coma? And he told me exactly what it was. I don't know if it was Diprovan. I don't remember now, but it was, it's been yeah. years. But he, I mean, he told me, and it's that, you know, it's that fair similitude, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be completely perfect, but what I like to do is at least convey that, okay, the author's not faking this. The author's fired a gun. The author understands what a spent shell does. You know, the author or a spent round does. You know, the author understands it. I think that's really important. It's funny because I get, I get called. It's funny. I've been called on things in my books. Let's see if this has happened to you. Um, one of, this is based on something that happened in my own life. When I was uh, a little, I was like four and I was, I won't even go into why. I'll just tell you what happened. I was four and somebody had trapped a rat under their house in a trap and they threw it out in their front yard. God knows why. Four-year-old me walks up and tries to help the rat and is bitten. Oh, and geez. yeah, and the tooth breaks off in my middle finger. There's a there's something there's a metaphor in there somewhere. Anyway, um, take me to the hospital, and they're like, we're gonna have to. We the the, the animal died. And they couldn't really test it. They're like, well, we're gonna have to start him with the rabies shots. Well, two shots in, I go into anaphylactic shock. I can't handle it. I nearly, oh, you know, I nearly die. You know, they just said, they told my parents, well, we're just going to see if he, he you know, we just hope to God he doesn't have it. And I obviously didn't. So I put that basic story into my book. Mm -hmm. I had a guy get a hold of me and explain to me that is not how it works. These are, <laughs> <laughs> they do not give shots like that. There's no way you could have gone into shock. This whole thing, you know, and I was like, well, you're right. My family just lied to me all these years about this thing. <laughs> I mean, has that ever oh, happened yeah. to you? Do you get those know-it-all types? Oh, who... yes, I oh. do. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. always somebody because of their experience and their experience is the only way it happens. Yeah. That oh, that's perfect. argue with you. <laughs> their experience is the only way that happens. I love that. I've got to remember that. That's a great phrase. Gosh, Linda, that's a great phrase. Um, well, I, there's so much more we could talk about. And, you know, I'm probably going to bug you 
uh, down the road and ask you to come back, especially when your new book is ready. Hint, hint, yeah. hint, hint. Um, oh, so maybe to. I would like to have you back in the spring, it, unless this was terribly excruciating for you. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, all right, good, good. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the, the point in the show where I want to make sure because I have a tendency to, you know, just blah, blah, blah. Did I miss something that you'd like to mention to our listeners besides the fact they should go visit your website at lynettemburrows.com. Link will be in the show notes. What else? What did we miss, Lynette? Well, they can also follow me on, on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and Lynette M. Burroughs is how I'm known on all of them. So if you search for Lynette M. Burroughs, you will find me. But if you search for Lynette Burroughs, you will find someone else who lives in Great Britain and is not someone I wish to be associated with at all. Oh, okay. Wow. So <laughs> that's why there's an M in my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know, that's true. Because you, you see that sometimes with, you go, well, what's the big deal with the middle initial? Nah, I get you. Now, well, that's funny because there's a British Alex Greenwood and she is one of the greatest uh, football players they have over there. So I'm fine with that. <laughs> right she's right. more interesting well, than i am <laughs> um, unfortunately we have uh, very different opinions on child um parenting so um i i have a place on my blog in the frequently asked questions where i explain no <laughs> i'm not her <laughs> Oh, I, I do see this. You, you, yeah, you have in your FAQ, you were very good. And you're, you know, I like this too. You're so thorough, by the way, Lynette. I mean, you're, you've got links. You got, this is your policy on reblogging, quotes or links, which I think is great. Nobody, most people I know do not bother to put these out there. And I think it's so smart that you do. Guest posting, endorsements. This is, this is great. It's such, so well thought out. Um, well, definitely, um, I will put the link in the show notes. And of course, obviously, folks, that's where you can go to find out more. Um, Books available where? On Amazon and almost all the online stores you wish to go to. Anybody ever hit you up for autograph books or anything? Do you sell yes. those? Or is, okay. um, I can do that. Um, I have um, access to be able to accept credit cards. Great. Um, I don't have that as a feature on my website yet because it's not often enough to... Yeah. want to go to that kind of depth, but um, I certainly can. And um, very soon, like probably Friday, if I get it done, I will be posting my 500th blog post. Holy cow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll be doing a little bit of a giveaway with that, with some autographed books that, uh, I can use as prizes and enticements. I need to make sure I keep an eye out for that when I promote this episode to remind <laughs> people, hey, you, you just got the tip of the iceberg listening to her here. Go for this contest and go read this 500th uh, post. This is exciting. You know, Lynette, I, I said that earlier. I generally view Twitter as fairly toxic, but every now and then, you, you just meet a gem. And I, I am just thrilled that you had the time to come talk to us here at Mysterious Goings On. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I've had a very nice time, enjoyed it very much, and look forward to doing another one soon. Okay, do not be bashful. When your book is ready, talk <laughs> yes, to sir. me, okay? All right, Lynette M. Burroughs, I hope you enjoy the author of My Soul to Keep, Fellowship, and many, many more coming your way. Links in the show notes at mgopod.com. And listeners, you'll find a lot more about me, if, as if you wanted to find out more about me, but you can. You can find links to my books. You can find links to an entire archive of four plus years of great interviews like this one at mgopod.com. Don't forget our Halloween snippet opportunity. If you want to get your scary story on the Halloween episode of this show, um, there'll be a link and instructions in the show notes. All right. I see by the clock on the wall that my rambling is done. So until next time, keep reading. From regular expenses to occasional splurges, there's a lot to buy. Why not get cash back every time you spend? With the PenFed Power Cash Rewards Card, you get cash back on every purchase. That's everywhere, every time you use it. 
You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Visit PenFed.org slash PowerCash to apply. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. From regular expenses to occasional splurges, there's a lot to buy. Why not get cash back every time you spend? With the PenFed Power Cash Rewards Card, you get cash back on every purchase. That's everywhere, every time you use it. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Visit PenFed.org slash PowerCash to apply. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA.